technology is great, and I think it's, it is truly going to transform the way we provide care. But if you don't have a care model that fits with the technology, it's not going to be helpful. I'd like to look at AI as an example, right? I mean, in the beginning, when we started to build, we, we were looking at just testing different algorithms for, I mean, it was a whole host of things. But what we forgot was the practical implementation of using those algorithms. So yes, it's nice to be able to predict things and look at different outcomes and, and what the risk factors are for patients or for your employees or members. But if you don't actually know how you're going to intervene mm -hmm. and take that data or that information and implement it to use, then, then what's the point of the algorithm, right? Welcome to another meeting of the minds, this time coming live from the Young Health Leaders Summit down here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I am joined by Emily Fry, who is the VP of Innovation Operations at Geisinger Health. Thank you for having me. Let's just start with uh, who, who are you? What's your personal background and, and why you're, how you landed in this uh, pathway? Sure, yeah. So I'm from Detroit. I started my career at Beaumont Health, uh, working in the front desk and registration at a physical therapy office loved healthcare from the very beginning. I can't remember a time where I said I didn't want to be in healthcare. I just knew growing up. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do in healthcare, mm -hmm. but I knew that my mission was to serve people in the communities and healthcare was the way I wanted to do that. So, um, you know, I really worked through my career in different roles to see what I wanted to do and, and ultimately landed working for Karen Murphy, our chief innovation officer mm -hmm. at Geisinger to build out um, the, the next generation of innovation. And we, uh, we named that the Steel Institute for Health Innovation. And we have um, quite a large breadth of, of work we're doing now. And I'm really excited to see what's happened. It's been about five and a half years of growing that. Um, so very excited. Oh, that's, that's awesome to hear. So five years of this structured innovation approach. That's, that's correct. So to, to help the audience understand, because like there, there's all kinds of words like, innovation, transformation, and things like that, that they're, they're a little bit loaded. So I like to level set and just get an understanding of what your view or what Geisinger's view is of, like, how, how do you do overall define innovation? Defining innovation, yeah. So we define innovation at the Steele Institute, a, a fundamentally different approach to solving a problem with quantifiable outcomes. And, and we define well, it I have that to pause, I have to pause you there because uh, I looked on the website before and like uh, that's word for word. So like y'all are obviously seeing, uh, seeing on the same. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it is ingrained in what we say and, and how we define it. And I think about it, if, if we get a new problem that we want to solve or a request from a, an innovator, you know, that's the question that runs through my mind. Is it fundamentally different? And are we going to be solving it with quantifiable outcomes? Are there ways to measure it? And so that's how we look at it um, in order to really make the next steps for feasibility and, and building out the business model. So I feel like there's a that that, that has to have come from muscle memory, right? Like <laughs> five and a half years of muscle memory. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. Okay, so uh, that, that's I, I think that's a, a really good takeaway already. Is like taking away from your muscle memory of like what's been what's been able to work and and uh like using those standards to judge innovations that people might be filtering through their own organizations yeah i mean i think you have to be comfortable with failure um mm -hmm. i'm not going to say we haven't tested and, and failed at things over the years but that's the point of innovation right i mean you have to be comfortable that that memory and muscle memory is built through those failures and experiences and and what and how to approach different um different types of innovation because innovation itself is a broad word, right? We, we can be working within the patient access center. We can be working with actually clinicians who are providing care. We can be doing innovation in the back office operations. So you never know what you're going to be working on. And, and you really have to build out the muscle memory of, of what's worked in the past to help you implement for the future. Well, let's zoom in, like, like taking that muscle memory, taking that focus on is it truly novel and can it be implemented? 
can you zoom in on uh, maybe a recent innovation uh, or, or uh, something that, that you and your team are proud of that you've done recently? Sure. I mean, I have a couple of things I'd say I'm really proud of. Um, I'll call out the work we're doing with our chronic disease management command center. We call it Connected Care 365 and really expanding across the spectrum of, of chronic disease management from your lowest acuity to highest acuity and managing those transitions of care and remotely monitoring them. So using technology and enabling our providers and our clinicians across those chronic disease uh, management spectrums and but also really focused on the care model. I think that's something that I've learned over the years is that technology is great and I think it's it is truly going to transform the way we provide care but if you don't have a care model that fits with the technology it's not going to be helpful. So really focusing on, on how you're going to build out that care model to then use the technology which enables quicker more efficient direct patient care. I'd like to go a little bit deeper on that because that, that is exciting is understanding there's technological innovations uh, available, but if you don't have a care model that fits some of the innovation, then it's kind of a non-starter, right? Right. I mean, I, I'd like to look at AI as an example, right? We have had so much, well, AI has been around for many, many years, mm -hmm. but in the recent years, we've absolutely increased the, the focus and attention in building algorithms. And I've noticed, I mean, in the beginning when we started to build, we, we were looking at just testing different algorithms for, I mean, it was a whole host of things. But what we forgot was the practical implementation of using those algorithms. So that practical implementation is very important to think about how you're going to use technology. So you're, you're really spitting on some powerful stuff here uh, because, because I think a lot of people, when they look at data science, artificial intelligence, it is in a world outside of them because they don't know Python, SQL, R, and those, those kinds of things. But there's a whole world outside of just the algorithm, just the uh, success of making a, a, a prediction right. that involves the strategy and how people are going to uh, actually be using it. So I, what the, the words you just said, I just want to use that as an open call to yeah. like find ways to get involved in that strategic element of how artificial intelligence is implemented. Yeah, don't be scared to, to dive in. I mean, you obviously are going to need that technical expertise um, as a part of the team, but mm -hmm. depending on what you're working on, there is, a, there is a strategy around developing what factors you're going to include in the algorithm. There's a strategy around how you're going to evaluate it based on the benchmarks that you're pulling. Um, and, and we always, back to that quantifiable outcomes, we're always measuring what we're doing. So we want to make sure that we're pulling in data to benchmark against whatever we're solving for. Excellent. And I, I can add on to it, like uh, if you're a data scientist or analyst watching, I'll let you know that your best work is going to be when you're working cross-functional and understanding those downstream needs and understanding the, the impact that your work has on consumers and patients. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a word in your title after innovation that is operations. And we've, we've touched on it a little bit. We've talked about like your filter for knowing whether or not an innovation is, is a, a starter or not. But can you get deeper into, well, we, we had this little joke uh, from, from yesterday, like if an entrepreneur innovates in a forest and no patient engages, was it truly innovation? Tree yeah. falls in the forest joke. But uh, basically, could, could, you, could, could you get uh, deeper into what innovation operations actually means? Sure. I mean, at, at the highest level, I help manage the institute's operations, right? So um, looking at the budget, looking at the, the different teams across the institute and what they need to be enabled, um, and monitoring and measuring those quantifiable outcomes. So I'm really a support mechanism to the different departments that sit under the Steel Institute. And then I serve, um, as we think about the pipeline of innovation, um, working and talking with those innovators to find the next thing that we're going to be working on. Um, it, it's a constant... Uh, review of priorities and and potential and so one of my jobs is to really look and monitor that potential from our not only inside innovators but outside in the market and how that might impact us. So I, I feel like a, a lot of people uh, look at innovation as something that is either happening on the front lines or happening in coffee shops on the backs of napkins and things like that. Um, <laughs> How, how do, what problem was the, the Steel Institute solving? Like when, 
when you when, when the team started to organize around around this concept, what was the the kind of the poor state and what's happened as a result of having this structure around innovation? Sure, I mean. Geisinger has, we weren't just like starting innovation at Geisinger. There was a culture truly ingrained in the employees at Geisinger. Um, and it's been this way for many, many years. I mean, we look at the history, um, proven care models was one of those big innovations that Geisinger had, the fresh food pharmacy. Those are things that were around. Our MyCode program, very innovative and impactful in the value-based care setting. Um, that was around before our Steel Institute. Uh, what we are is we are a vehicle to enable that, that innovation. Those things were born out of ideas within departments and really built um, the infrastructure and, and we wanted to give an enabler to build those infrastructures out uh, for employees as well as the, the, uh, the patients we serve. Great, and that, that is so important to, to have a, a true structure around innovation because you, you, you can, of course, let everything happen under the sun or you could be a, a really restrictive uh, uh, to an innovation pipeline, but by having that structure, by having some defined routines, I mean, it's, it's my hunch, but yeah. I, th I think it allows, uh, uh, allows people to bring things to the table in a much more uh, controlled manner and, and maybe even be able to consider more ideas than under the past when uh, the, like with less structure, you're not really sure about what's going to be coming to the top. Right, right, exactly. I think it's, it's once again, it's an enabler to it, and it gives them the ability to, to, I mean, we ultimately have to prioritize. There's so much that needs to be done in healthcare mm -hmm. um, to improve the consumer experience, the quality of care um, across the nation. And, and as we look at um, nurse shortages across the nation, like there are factors that just come into our, our lives and, and we have to solve for them and we become that vehicle to help accelerate um, reviewing and, and helping solve for those problems. Do you often find that when someone brings something to the table that there's already something parallel or close enough that could be used to, to help with whatever their, their goal was? Yeah, you mean outside in the, the market or? Already, already in place. Like I, I think about it in terms of like an inventory of of things you already have, maybe somebody's yeah. bringing something to the table that... Yeah, I think it's it's a balance. There's definitely some where we, we take pre-existing capabilities and it's more just an education or tweaking of the pathway mm -hmm. um, in, in the way we can use the, the enabling, whether it's technology or care model. Um, or it, it, there's a lot out there that we do. Um, so automation's a great example, right? Uh, we have this enabling technology that's able to really um, enhance or accelerate and create more efficient processes by either creating a human in the loop mm -hmm. capability and or taking the human out of the process. Um, and so that's a pre-existing technology we have to enable them. But to your point, we still have to build out the specific automation based on their process. So. Um, there's a lot of capabilities that we have that people don't know about and we, we just have to bring them to the table based on the problem uh, that they have. Got it, got it. Um, and it, it makes me wonder, um, so th th there's this library of things that are happening and, and uh, lots of innovations that you already have on the table. Is there a mechanism that you're using to, to sell that internally to let people know about what's available or like, how do you, how do you get the word out about the... Uh, like the, the pathway to, to innovating there? Well, this podcast is a great way to do that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a lot of conversation. It's relationships and, and building that. Um, because to do innovation, while well, I do believe you have to have a team that trusts each other too, mm -hmm. um, because you're challenging the status quo. Uh, so it is, it's communicating, having those conversations. And, and also, when you build successful innovations, the word spreads. Exactly. And... It, it makes me think, uh, like, built successful innovations, the word is spreading. What do you consider the source of innovation? You, me, I mean, I, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that you never know. It, it can come from the top, it can come from the bottom. It's, uh, there's, there's so much value to being integrated and, and boots on the ground and, and understanding the the domain or area where the problem is born out of. And I also believe that there's also a very significant value to having that bird's eye view and understanding the connections to the strategy. So, um, 
you know, one of my jobs is to constantly listen to people. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, keeping an open ear and an open eye out and what's happening in the market and, and um, really just hearing people's problems will allow, you'll, you'll get themes and start to curate um, what is the true, the core, the root of the problem and, and how then do you strategically, based on that bird's eye view, solve for that problem. Wonderful. And, and again, everything that, that you're saying, it just points back to allowing people to kind of work in their element, but then bring some of their best ideas to the table and see if that works from a strategic uh, perspective. Right. So it, it makes me wonder also, like I'm talking about a lot of really smart people working on uh, important problems, but a lot, like, like we were talking about the fact that there's failure involved. Why do good ideas fail? Why do good ideas fail? Because we, um, and I'll, I'll give a plug for human-centered design, we don't c consider the consumer's experience. We don't ex consider what the consumer actually wants um, when you're solving the problem. Uh, so it's important to remember the end in mind. Uh, it seems so simple, but, but actually gets quite complex depending on the problem you're trying to solve. But I think it's just so important to remember um, you know, who are you solving this for? Not just what the problem you're solving is, but who are you solving it for? And what are your intended outcomes? Like, what are the end goals? And keeping that at the forefront in the beginning before you solve the problem. I think any good idea, um, and timing. I think mm -hmm. timing is a good point, too. You know, the time has to be right for the good idea to really spread. That, you know, uh, majorly important. And uh, honestly, like working in a technical role myself in, in uh, as some technical solutions and things like that, we can often get really caught up in, uh, oh, wow, this, uh, this, this code runs great or this algorithm like re uh, really had a high predictive accuracy rate yeah. or, or what have you. But if it's not uh, aligned with something that's meaningful for a consumer, something that's meaningful, meaningful an outcome, it was something that was really pretty, a really pretty solution that didn't really have a practical value. Right. I wonder, is there anything that you're like, Chris, why didn't you ask about this? <laughs> oh, gosh, no. I mean, I think you you hit it. Uh, if you're looking to build an innovation shop or, or even just looking to create some more structure around what you do in innovation within your organization, I think, I think there is a defined framework that you can create um, with allowing for, obviously being innovation, allowing for the ability to uh, create new lanes um, or processes based on the problems you're trying to solve. Um, and I think, I mean, I guess the one thing I'd say is really um, focusing on the fact that it's a team effort. Don't go at it alone. Um, understand what's been done in the past. Take experiences from all sorts of uh, diverse sets of people to be able to truly solve a problem well. I, I think that's the other thing I'd add. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, we, uh, there's no hero narrative. There's right. a, a bunch of people that are working together. I, I think people really often forget that. Yeah, it's 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 very easy because you get so focused, but you have to make sure you're you're getting perspective. Understand, and um, that that just makes me think to being. VP of Innovation Operations at Geisinger. I know that there are thousands and thousands of people constantly trying to put their ideas through to you every day. Uh, <laughs> you said that you're fielding 12 to 24 pitches a day and all that. Uh, so that I, I know that gives you a lot of exposure to a lot of great thinking. So it makes me wonder, if you had a magic wand, and we ask this to everybody, but if you had a magic wand and you were able to change one thing about our healthcare system, what would that be? Well, I'll just say, there's not one thing, first, <laughs> as a clarifier. There's just so much to work on. Um, mm -hmm. But I think today, my biggest, uh, I'll say, pet peeve in healthcare is the interoperability challenge. We have so many fragmented systems. We still have people on paper. And, you know, as we think about the advancements in technologies and being able to truly use those well, um, it, cre it creates the need for interoperability to communicate across systems, across different organizations. And, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues and, and we likened it, the, the ability what one day 
will use technology to just have a band on our wrist and be able to walk into any facility and just scan it and everything's there and we want to share it and we can because of interoperability but that's, we got a long way to go there so if i could figure out a way to connect um, across the domains of federal state local data sharing and and creating those connections safely mm -hmm. um, that would be great yeah that that's honestly so great that it's it's hard to even imagine how, how great it is like just the idea that if you go from one facility to the next there uh, to the next that's completely unrelated you're vacationing in uh, North Carolina or Wyoming yeah. or what have you um, vacation spot in North Carolina of course but um, yeah just the, the ability to know that if you're being seen, there's going to be an, understand, uh, an understanding coming from all these different sources. I mean, that, that, that's just gigantic to me. Yeah, I think it's getting the right information at the right time for those individuals that are serving you. That's something we struggle with. I mean, you look at just even outside of going on vacation, going into a normal patient visit. There are so many people that experience the frustration of filling out the information pre-visit getting to the office and filling out the same information, getting into the room and having that conversation about the same information. The redundancies we have in healthcare today, um, I'm not saying everything could be solved through mm -hmm. interoperability, but I think a lot of that, that rub would be able to be really reduced. Yeah, and maybe it would even open up greater conversations if there were you know, like I know that healthcare is extremely competitive, but if there was a, a deeper conversation, putting the competition aside yeah. for the betterment of communities, populations, and patients, then yeah. we'd have a big benefit from that. I absolutely agree. Emily, this was awesome. A lot of people, I hope, are going to agree with me that it was awesome. Some of those people are going to want to follow you and, and see what you're up to. What's the best way people can uh, follow you, keep in touch? Yeah, follow me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to chat. Cool. It is. It's how I found her. So yeah. <laughs> uh, much appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for all the great work you're doing. Much appreciated. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, you can find all our episodes and transcripts at wobothealth.com slash meeting of the minds. There you can subscribe, which will keep you in the loop on new episodes and our LinkedIn live sessions with healthcare leaders like the one you heard today.